Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. We are uh, well into an amazing, what I think is historic series uh, on Mormon Stories about uh, Mormon Church truth claims um, based on the amazing work of of a lay, I'll call him a lay scholar, Mike, um, who has put together an amazing website uh, called uh, LDS Discussions that can be found at ldsdiscussions.com. And we have covered so many cool topics so far on treasure digging and the Book of Mormon. Um, and uh, we are now just uh, starting to also talk about anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, which we just recorded an episode on. And today we have an episode that kind of follows on that, where we're going to be talking very specifically about the King James Bible problem in the Book of Mormon. And that's the episode for today. And I think that a lot of Mormons would never even think that the King James Bible appearing in the Book of Mormon would in any way be problematic because, hey, they're both scriptures. It's the stick of Joseph. It's the stick of Judah. They belong together. So why wouldn't the King James Version Bible appear in the Book of Mormon? Right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, that's just it. And so it's one of those things where, like, for me as a believer, I never really thought about it just because you're just, that's just, it is what it is, right? You just use the King James Bible language and all that. Um, so, you know, it, it ends up being one of those things where the problem gets deeper the more you look into it. And kind of as we've been doing all these episodes, they're building on each other. And that's why um, I think on this episode, you're going to see a little overlap, but it's because now all of these things we've been talking about are kind of colliding together in a, in a way that I hope will not just make this episode more meaningful, but maybe make those previous ones that you've listened to or watched a little more meaningful as well, because it's starting to tie these things back together. Yeah. Yep. So there'll be a tiny bit of uh, overlap as there always will be, but this is a really important episode. Um, what, what's the, uh, the link for this, the essay for um, the corresponds with this episode can be found at ldsdiscussions.com slash KJV. Yep. We'll include a link um, to that essay in the show notes, along with other um, essays and episodes and topics and, and references that we make. We also should let people know at the outset that we're including, if you just wait, you know, at least a few days to a week after these episodes are released, um, we have show notes and time codes where you can actually jump to portions of the interview that you want to hear. We're trying to balance um, not going too fast for people that are new to these episodes uh, or to these issues, but also not going slow to people right. that have been studying this stuff for a long time. We hope we're striking a good balance. We're doing our best uh, to do so. But also feel free to slow these down at 0.8 speed or 0.75 speed if you think me or Mike talk too fast <laughs> or if the topics are too advanced. And if you've heard all this before and you just want to get to the meat, Feel free to speed it up to 1.25 speed or one and a half speed or even two speed, or you can use the time codes to jump backwards and forwards as you wish. But please, in your feedback, understand we're trying to make these uh, these episodes meaningful and relevant to people no matter where they are on the spectrum. So try to be kind in your in your feedback. Yep. Um, all right. Well, why don't you go ahead and give us? Oh, oh, and I'll just say one last thing as we, we try and say in all of our episodes. We are not doing this to destroy faith. We're not doing this to tear down the Mormon church or to take people out of the Mormon church. We're doing this entire series under the in the spirit of informed consent. We believe that everyone should know what the Mormon church truth claims are and what the evidence is that support them because so many important decisions are made in people's lives uh, based on uh, these truth claims and the history and the context um, that they're provided, whether they're born in the church or an investigator, or they're looking into the church now. So the, it's the it's the spirit of informed consent, and not any desire to destroy uh, that hopefully informs these episodes. And we promise to do our best to be as respectful as possible. And sometimes we come off as critical, but I think that's only when the evidence just really merits it. But even when the evidence merits criticism, we're still going to try and be as respectful as we can. Right, Mike? Yeah. I mean, and again, it's just, it's one of those things where I think for me, um, I, I look at it, like we talk about, you know, it's not, we're not going door to door telling people who are in the church, like, Hey, you're wrong. This is 
for me, uh, my belief is that most people that come across LDSdiscussions.com are already having questions. And so it's about giving uh, what I feel the evidence leads us to and giving that, giving the sources for that and giving the apologetics that the church gives to try to explain why I don't think they necessarily work for these topics. And so the real goal here was, like I said at the beginning of these uh, episodes, I was asked to put this together as a way to show whether or not the truth claims of Mormonism were true or not. And um, so everyone who watches these or listens to this can do with, with it what they want. Um, but I also think it, even if you disagree with the outcome of where I'm at, at least you can hopefully acknowledge that this evidence is out there um, and maybe it won't change the way you feel about certain things, but maybe it will allow you to maybe be a little more nuanced with things, or maybe it'll help your relationships with family members who leave. There, there's a lot of different, I think, hopefully outcomes that can come from this, um, from people having a better understanding of the the issues and the evidence um, to kind of understand where other people are coming from as well. So hopefully, even if you disagree with the the ultimate outcomes of the, these overviews, it'll at least give you some perspective that'll help you elsewhere, uh, you know, at the same time. And if you're a Mormon bishop or Mormon state president or mission president or a, a church education system, yeah. seminary or institute instructor, or even a Sunday school teacher or an elders quorum instructor or a Relief Society teacher or youth teacher, it will help you teach an honest, accurate view of our history and of our truth claims so you're not misleading yep. future generations. Yep, exactly. All right, so what is the problem with Joseph Smith using the King James Bible? Give us that overview. Yeah, and so basically um, this particular episode is going to um, be a, a sort of getting to a culmination of what we've been talking about in these other episodes, which is why the Book of Mormon creates major problems for the truth claims of the Book of Mormon being an ancient historical text. And we're going to look at some areas of the King James Bible itself now, looking more at the text and some of the errors that are in it um, to better understand where this material is coming from that ends up in the Book of Mormon. And just as a note, we, you know, just kind of saying it again, now that we're starting to kind of build to the, you know, sort of the climax of the Book of Mormon episodes um, in this project, uh, there's going to be some overlap, but I think it's going to be important because it should hopefully give more context to some of the earlier episodes. And also, you know, it's going to give more context to some of the biblical scholarship ones we're going to do um, once we get out of the Book of Mormon. So I think that this episode is going to give um, a lot more kind of depth to some of the stuff we've already done and hopefully kind of set up some of the stuff we're going to do in future episodes as well. All right. So uh, so the next slide yeah. um, it asks the question, why the King James Bible presents problems for the Book of Mormon? Yeah. And this is just, again, it, it looks at some of the areas we've, we've kind of covered a little bit. So there are certain things that the King James Bible is going to do for the Book of Mormon that is really going to kind of present issues such as the bottom line is it's anachronistic to be in the Book of Mormon because of the fact that this translation was not done until 1611. Um, which means that it is not an ancient translation. It's a modern, more modern translation that is not going to be accessible to the Book of Mormon people. And that becomes problematic when there are certain phrases and wordings that are unique to the King James Bible that are going to work their way into the Book of Mormon. Um, and, and one of the bigger things, and this is one that is kind of was interesting to me when I when I kind of did kind of stopped privileging the King James Bible is the translation of the King James Bible is not considered to be one of the most accurate and is actually considered an inferior translation to the more commonly used um, translations today, um, the NIV, the NASB. Those are different translations that are more commonly used now because the King James Bible obviously was was done, you know, by scholars um, at the time. Um, but you know, it was again, it was done without maybe some of the the. I don't think I think it was done before the Dead Sea Scroll, so it's not going to have as much um, of the earlier texts that some of them have, and so that is you know, the Book of Mormon, Mormon church in a lot of ways is dated because of the fact that we still use the King James Bible in it. Um, but most churches today would not use it just because they don't consider it to be uh, nearly as, as good and as accurate. Um, the King James Bible obviously includes the New Testament, I mean, because it is the Bible, but that should not be in the Book of Mormon. We've covered that in the Anachronism episode, but we'll cover that a little bit more here as to why that presents issues. And um, one final thing is just to say, going back almost to the early episodes, the use, using the King James Bible in the Book of Mormon goes directly against the witness accounts of the tight translation, which is to say, we are told that the rock and the hat gives exact words that will not change until they're written down. Yet here, we're basically going to show that, and we've shown in previous episodes too, that the King James Bible is used, you know, 
all over the place in the Book of Mormon, which tells us that either God is presenting the King James Bible through the rock and the hat, or Joseph Smith is using the Bible um, to pull in phrases and in, in even big chapters of Isaiah. And, and that presents an issue when you look at the accounts that are given by the witnesses to the process. All right. That's a wonderful overview. And are you saying that all of these bullets are going to be covered in today's episode? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, let's jump in. Yeah. And so with uh, mistranslations of the King James Version that end up in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And this is one we really haven't talked about too much. And so the King James Bible has errors in the translation, which is going to happen anytime you're translating an ancient text into a different language, especially one of this length. But the problem is those errors should not appear in the Book of Mormon, given that Joseph Smith is claiming to be receiving translation of a different source that is not the KGV through the gift and power of God. These errors um, being in the Book of Mormon are going to leave fingerprints as to how they got there. And then that allows you to understand who brought them into it. And so these are errors that maybe wouldn't seem like huge deals, but they do allow us from a textual standpoint to understand how they got there and when they were put there and who would have put them in there. Okay, so just to restate what I think I heard you say is that the King James Bible um, has errors in it, and the version of the King James Bible that Joseph Smith would have used would have contained some of those errors, yep. and magically those are appearing in the Book of Mormon. Okay, so you're yes. getting some examples of that now. Yeah, and so this is just a really quick one, which is a good one, because um, if you look at Isaiah 2.16 in the NRSV, it says, against all the ships of Tarshish and against all the beautiful craft. And then in Isaiah in the King James Bible, it says, and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the pleasant pictures. And then in second Nephi, it says, and upon all the ships of the sea and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures. And we have a write up on this overview uh, page on LDSdiscussions.com. And we're borrowing from a write up that explains this particular error. And what they say is one of the reasons I like this example is because it's a twofer. In the same verse, we have the Book of Mormon preserving a KGV mistranslation while introducing a new redaction. It's difficult to argue that God is simply, simply transmitting the KGV to Joseph, errors and all, when in the very same verse, Joseph is going to make another incorrect redaction. And if you look at our overview, overview page, we have some links to kind of show why they consider this an incorrect redaction. Um, and then they say, another reason I like it is because the source of the mistranslation is clear, meaning that we know he's pulling directly from the KGV. Um, and the implication would be that there was no Egyptian loan word that could be shifted from it. So what, really what, quickly for okay. those who just heard a bunch of words, but didn't yeah. actually detect the error. So you've got an NRSV verse in Isaiah and then a King James verse next to it. Yeah. What's, the, what's the error? So in the King James um, Bible, they're going to say um, upon instead of against. And then instead of saying pleasant oh. pictures, they say, uh, or instead of saying beautiful craft, they're saying pleasant pictures. And so Joseph Smith is going to bring in those errors from the. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? Um, no, this is something I don't think there's any real, um, real argument on today. I don't know if it's because of the Dead Sea Scrolls or if it's just because when you look at the original Hebrew now, they just know it's wrong. But this is one I don't think anyone argues against that. Okay, the NRC... so, the, so the wrong. So when when the King James scholars made this translation in what the four what what year? Six, 1611 when it came out so they translated a hebrew word to mean uh, to be what in english uh so they they have it say pleasant pictures and the actual translation would be beautiful craft okay now more modern scholars who really can read hebrew well yeah. say that it should have been beautiful craft correct not pleasant pictures correct and then um, and there's also upon all yep in in the bad in in the King James version that's been corrected to say against all instead of right all. okay yes okay and sorry so, no no it's and, and that's just it it's and it's one of those things where it's like the actual wording isn't as important as just showing that not only is Joseph Smith pulling directly in from the KGV which is the incorrect translation but when he's making the little changes um and, and that's why if you go to the the the, the LDS discussion slash KGV, we link to it. it, it of course, these you things have a that, ton yeah. of explanation. But well, he's just to be clear for those listening in Second Nephi twelve sixteen, it's yep. carrying forth the King James errors. Yes, because I'm seeing their um, pleasant pictures instead of beautiful craft. Yep, and it's saying up up. Oh, but it's saying upon all. Oh, it shouldn't be saying a 
upon he's just he's the adding in all of the ships of the sea in front of Tarshish. Right. So yeah, and so it's just it's an example of where you can show Joseph Smith pulling directly in from the KGV, and you can't really argue he's pulling from some other source because the KGV has this unique error, whereas the other translations don't. And so you know it's coming from the KGV, which is a problem. And what's the you're... redaction? Uh, I think the redaction. Oh, man, I need to look it up because I, I should I should have looked that up. Had an extra slide, knows. but yeah, we'll have there, to fix that. Just let people know there's a redaction where Joseph yeah. takes something out. Yeah. That that uh you know okay yeah it's, and it's, it's, these tweaking things yeah and so it's just it's showing that he's making these small tweaks and that's what we're going to get into in the next slide because this is where this is the pattern that's going to kind of pick up here as we okay, go I know none of us are scholars so we're just yeah it's tough off the top of my head I, I can't remember exactly why I just I know that it's a very long article that explains it as these things tend to go when they're talking about the specific meanings of, of words from these, these different texts but but as um, I know you'll admit to later all. all all biblical scholar, pretty much all biblical scholars across the world, are going to agree with this these translation issues yeah. that you're highlighting, including the church's own biblical scholars like yeah. Bill McClellan, like David Bakavoyer, Brian Hauglid before they you know lost their faith, etc. Right? Yeah. I mean, these these are not really controversial. It's more again, it's just a problem because of the fact that we're so reliant on the King James Bible. Otherwise, this would not be a big issue. Okay. All yep. right, that takes us to the next slide. Yeah, so which this is, is what, italicized words in the yep. King James version that appear in the Book of Mormon. And this is one of the areas a lot of people point to because obviously the italicized words in the King James Bible are there to make it more readable. And so the translators would insert words in italics that were not part of the original translation, but they did it to make the text flow a little more naturally for the readers. And this These is something King James's own scholars are including yes. italicized words. Yes. But they're not in the original scrolls. Correct. Right. They're just what the scholars felt would be helpful to emphasize certain words. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And so but, but earlier or later versions of the King James Bible, not to mention other different translations, are going to have probably either no italics or italicized different words. Is that yes. right? Correct. Okay. okay, keep going. And so the point is, this is, was well known during Joseph's time. And so W.W. W. Phelps um, actually cites this in an 1833 um, article in the Morning and Evening Star, Evening and Morning Star. And he says, as to the errors in the Bible, any man possessed of common understanding knows that both the Old and New Testaments are filled with errors, obscurities, italics, and contradictions, which must be the work of men. And then W.W. W. Phelps actually a few months earlier um, makes this a more distinctive um, kind of claim where he says, the Book of Mormon, as a revelation from God, possesses some advantage over the old scripture. It has not been tinkered by the wisdom of man, um, where he has not been tinctured by the wisdom of man, of man with here and there an italic word to supply deficiency. So they're outright saying the italics are almost like a crutch to make it more readable. And W. W. Phelps is saying that because the Book of Mormon is a direct translation, it doesn't have that same problem. And as we're going to see, it, it does have that same problem. Okay, yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, see if the Book of Mormon really avoids the italics problem. Yeah, and so this is um, from David Wright, who is a pretty, um, I think, respected scholar of, of this stuff. And so he wrote extensively on Joseph Smith's use of the KGV chapters of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. And this is a good summary um, from the problems we're mentioning when it comes to the italics. And so it says, depending on how conservatively you judge them between 22 and 38% of all differences between the book of Mormon and KGV's Isaiah parts text are associated with words italicized in the KGV. Skousen, who's a, a scholar that we mentioned, he's more of an apologetic scholar, uh, calculates it at 29%. So just say 30% ish. The difference is that only 3.6% of the words in the relevant KGV passages are italicized. So the correlation is significant. So what it's saying is that only 3.6% of the words are italicized, but they still account for about 30% of the differences. That's a, that's a pretty telltale sign where the focus is. Um, furthermore, 40% of words italicized in the KGV are missing in their corresponding Book of Mormon passages. Of the other 60%, many passages had environmental changes related to those italics. The Book of Mormon seems to be particularly concerned with KGV italics, which suggests that it's derivative of the English KGV text rather than an ancient common ancestor. These revisions often cause problems. For example, Isaiah 51.19 reads, These two things are come unto thee. The Book of Mormon changes the italicized words things to sons. The revision doesn't work in Hebrew since the phrase is formulated with the feminine, whereas the word son is masculine. There are many more similar examples you can read in Wright's essay. And so what this is saying is that Joseph Smith 
is clearly aware of the italics problem. And so as he's bringing these these um, chapters into the Book of Mormon, his entire, I shouldn't say his entire, but a large part of his focus is on figuring out how to make the italics work. So when they say that only 3.6% of the words are italics in those Isaiah chapters, and yet about 30% of the changes are of the italics, that's telling you that an overwhelming focus is on the italics as opposed to the rest of the text. And even then, Joseph Smith is trying to sometimes change the words around the italics to make it make more sense. But in this case, when he does it, he makes an error. And these are the, the like I said earlier, the fingerprints that Joseph Smith is going to leave on this text that you can tell without any question is starting with the King James Bible and not starting with um, words appearing on a rock and a hat. Because again, we know what version of the King James Bible Joseph Smith had in his possession. Right. And so we know the source material of where this would come from. And so when you see these changes are, are uh, completely dependent on the source text he had, there's really no reason that you could logically say, well, he started with what the rock on it, what the, what the seer slash peepstone was saying, and then, and then adapted it because that, it, it doesn't matter when, when your source material is something that we know, you know, Joseph Smith had in his possession. And I'm just going to say, you mentioned David Wright, and I'm just going to share something that, you know, that may seem a bit jarring to some of you. Um, is my understanding is that David Wright was a classics professor at BYU when I was there. And my understanding is not only was he kicked out of BYU um, or he left BYU because of pressure, but eventually I believe he was excommunicated from the Mormon church. And some of you might go, well, well, wow, that automatically discredits him. If he's excommunicated, then he's a bad guy and we shouldn't listen to him. But if you go back into the 19, you know, the 1990s and beyond, even starting with Fom Brody, you find that when a scholar is excommunicated for apostasy, be it Fawn Brody for her book, No Man Knows My History, be it Michael Quinn for his book, um, Joseph Smith, you know, Folk Magic in the, in the Early um, Magic in the Early Mormonism Worldview, whatever the name of that book is, whether it's Grant Palmer, um, whether it is uh, others, Simon Southerton, David Wright. The church excommunicates scholars historically when they reveal truths about the church's truth claims that are problematic. So if you if you look at the credibility of Fawn Brody's scholarship, who David, who Richard Bushman himself acknowledges is one of our top Joseph Smith scholars, when you look at how all of Michael Quinn's writings about folk magic have proven true, along with his publications about post-manifesto polygamy and other things, and when you look at David Wright and, and even Brett Metcalf's scholarship, you'll find that all of them were spot on and that yesterday's apostate excommunications become today's gospel topics, essays, and apologetics. David Wright's excommunication becomes an endorsement of the validity of his work, not a denunciation. Is that fair? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I just I think the fact is we, we've talked about this in other episodes with different topics, but you know, David Wright is pulling these things out, but he's not being contradicted. He's being confirmed by by other scholars, and so it's not just one person. And again, you can look at the KGV and you can look at the Book of Mormon and you can do these these comparisons for yourself. And, and so David Wright's problem was the fact that he was coming up with articles that were telling us there's a problem here and making it public. And obviously, I think today the church operates a little differently. Obviously, you know, they're not going to come after someone like me for it because I think now it's, it's just out there. But back then, David Wright was doing something that hadn't been thought of. And so I think for a long time, they tried, they did try, you know, the September 6th and all that was an attempt to try to keep scholarship of the Book of Mormon faith promoting or else, you know, you would, you would face discipline. And I think now all of those people are being referenced in these gospel topics that say, I know Michael Quinn has been, um, I know other people have. And so it's really hard um, when you see that to not go, you know, why would they ask communicate for telling the truth? But, but the truth is in these cases um, they were because it, 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 these, these things are true. They're just not faith promoting. And so it, again, we've talked about this before. If, if your goal is to maintain faith and your equation is that it must be true. These episodes aren't for you. Um, but if you want to start with a clean slate and kind of get to where the evidence leads, um, you're going to end up in the same places that these guys did. I don't think you're going to be excommunicated for it, obviously, but but they were excommunicated in publishing these things, which which I'm certainly getting a lot of use out of um, to help me understand it. So I'm, I'm thankful to them, even though I know they went through problems for doing so. And many of the church's own gospel topics essays 
reference excommunicated, you know, the scholarship of excommunicated Mormons. Yep. And they do. Which validates, you know. All right. So, yeah. so the next slide is Joseph Smith leaving fingerprints when dealing with the italics. Yeah. And so just as we said in the last slide, obviously, it seems like there's a huge focus on the italics. And so he's aware of the problem. And we know that this is something known because W.W. Phelps mentions it twice, obviously, a few years later. But it's it's something that was not like people obviously understood these italics had kind of stuck out a bit. And so um, as we mentioned in the last slide, if Joseph Smith is reading the words off of a stone in a hat and the scribes can't write down the next part until it's written right, why are the KGV words being pulled in and all italicized or not? And so that is something, again, where we get into the type versus loose. You know, we, we have to acknowledge that Joseph Smith is using the King James Bible. And one of the best ways to illustrate how Joseph Smith is going to begin with the KGV text of Isaiah and then revise it as he saw fit is this example that Stan Larson was able to pull from the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon. And he says in 1 Nephi 20, 11, the words of Isaiah 48, 11, how should my name be polluted? Um, and um, the words my name are polluted, in, or sorry, the words my name are italicized. Um, those words were initial. it was initially revised to how should I suffer my name to be polluted? Um, then the KGV words, how should in the Book of Mormon, I were crossed out in a super linear, super linear revision, gave the final Book of Mormon declaration, I will not suffer my name to be polluted. This revision shows that for a biblical quotation of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith used the English KGV as a base text for the later revision in, that's embodied in the Book of Mormon. And this is one where um, he actually had access to parts of the surviving printer's manuscript. And you can see those changes on the printer's manuscript, which is showing that Joseph Smith is pulling the KGV into the text. And then they made this kind of superficial change on the printer's manuscript. So we know that he started with the KGV and then made the change. And that tells you that Joseph Smith is trying to make sense of those italics and to make them work. And so in this particular case, he puts, I suffer in front of the italicized my name. Um, and then at the end, um, he crosses out um, the, um, the how sh or that he changes it from how should I suffer to I will not suffer. And again, this it just shows the progression is KGV to how it was dictated to Oliver. And then the printer's manuscript has that final change. And that's a big deal because it shows us without any question where he's starting from in these Isaiah, Isaiah chapters. He's not starting from the seer slash peepstone and then working his way back to the KGV. He's starting with the KGV and working his way to the finished product. And you've already said this, but I'm going to ask you again. When the when the scholars are uh, creating the King James version of the Bible, why are they including italics? I think it's just because they're trying to translate this, you know, language, right? They're trying to translate like Hebrew into English, and when they're doing it, I think the literal translation isn't readable. It would come off kind of clunky, you know. So the italicized words is almost like to put like a a, a a filler in the middle so that it reads to you better. So when you're reading it, it doesn't read super clunky. And I don't know a good example, but I'm thinking it'd be something like, you know. Uh, I went car drive home and you might put like to the, or something like I went to the car so that you, when you're reading it, it's just it to a, a, someone who wants to read these stories at night to their family. It's going to make sense. It's going to feel comfortable as opposed to being this super clunky literal translation. That's going to lose kind of that readability to an English audience. Okay. So when Joseph is, is looking at the King James Bible, um, you know, behind the sheet or however he's doing it yeah. when he's, dictating out of his King James Bible to the scribes, these italics are kind of cues to him that he's at a part of the the, the verse that, that, that are problematic or yep. need further explanation, or maybe could even be uh, unclear in some way. Yep. And so just to make sure I understand, he's, we're seeing a, whenever there's a change, maybe important changes between the King James version of the Bible that he we know he has versus what ends up in the Book of Mormon, it's almost all it, it's oftentimes, you know, when Joseph was cued first firsthand beforehand by the italics that are there. Yeah, he's, and then when he makes the changes, oftentimes those changes don't reflect the original Hebrew or the original sources right. that we that we have in our possession. Correct. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the changes just don't make a lot of sense. And I, I'm sure there are some where you could say it made it closer, but again, I, I would say he's making a lot of changes. And so they're saying in Isaiah is changing, you know, like I, we were saying earlier, 30% of the italics are being changed. So he's making a lot of changes because he's aware that they aren't original to the text. And it just, again, leaves your fingerprint that 
who the author is because they're starting from the King James Bible. They're not starting with ancient records on gold plates. Okay. All right. The next, uh, next slide is new Testament material in the book of Mormon. So if we left, we've left the italics part now. Uh, we've left the italics for now. So now we're kind of looking at some of the errors that come into the new Testament and, and kind of the different, different examples of errors. So not, they're not all just like the same kind of error. And so it just shows that there's different areas where different kinds of errors are coming into the Book of Mormon to kind of show you that it's not just like one thing, it's it's a lot of things. And so Let's dive this, in. Yeah. yeah, this particular one, we, we've mentioned this on previous episodes, but any use of the New Testament material is anachronistic because of the fact that it wouldn't have been available on the brass plates. Um, but here's an example from Stan Larson's essay that we cited uh, in the previous slide. So Matthew 527 in the NRSV, which is considered a better translation says, you have heard that it was said, you sh shall not commit adultery. Matthew 527 in the KGV says, you have heard it, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then in third Nephi 1227, it says, behold, it is written by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. And so the phrase by them of old time is actually a late addition to the text of Matthew, which is a problem because if it's a late addition, it's not authentic to the original text. So that's a problem right there. And um, furthering that problem is that it's still a mistranslation of later manuscripts that include this edition. So it should, instead of saying by them of old time, it would read unto them of old time. So it should have said it is written by them unto, or it is written un, by that, wait, you would have say, um, you have heard that it was said unto them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what we have is a late addition to the, to the manuscripts that wouldn't be authentic to the original gospel and a mistranslation that both end up in the King James Bible that both get pulled in the Book of Mormon. So this is again showing that if the Book of Mormon is being translated off of ancient plates, first of all, you shouldn't have New Testament material anyways, but you certainly shouldn't have a late addition to the manuscript and a mistranslation. So this one gives you kind of three, three problems into one. And that these are the issues where the King James Bible is just giving us all of these clues as to where the foundational text is. And you cannot argue that Joseph Smith is, is translating off of like, directly off of ancient scrolls because it has something so unique to the King James Bible. Got it. Okay. That makes sense as to why uh, that's a problem. So uh, now we're going to address why these little phrases matter. Yeah. And so when you look at it, you would say, well, why does, why does the phrase unto them the whole time matter? It's, it's such, it's just a little throwaway phrase. Why do we care? And just, we've mentioned this in previous episodes, but if Jesus is, speak, is truly speaking the same words to the Americas as he did during his lifetime, as many apologists would argue, in order to give plausibility to the New Testament material being in the Book of Mormon, why is Jesus speaking to the Book of Mormon people in words that were not even original to the, um, man, to the earliest manuscripts, as well as giving improper translations of the words? And so these problems um, with using late editions they're not just isolated to one passage. We've covered this in the anachronisms um, episode where we talk about Deuter Isaiah, and those are going to have the same problem where you have material in there that wouldn't have been available until Lehi left. But in this case, it's just worse because not only is it anachronistic, but it's it's a mistranslation. So if you want to claim Jesus is saying the same thing, it just you have to then answer why Jesus would speak the same thing that is also has a late edition in an error. It just you can't make this. Um, you can't reconcile this problem unless you're willing to, again, as we, we've talked about in earlier episodes, give the space that kind of detaches it from the evidence. And you would not give that same space to another religion. I, I mean, like, I don't think you would. Yeah. And here's another way I'm thinking about it just as we're processing it. Like, we all know that the whole reason we needed a Book of Mormon was because the Bible was corrupt. Like Mormons teach, we believe in the Bible as far as it is translated correctly. Right. We all, you know... We, we believe in the Book of Mormon to be like the the most correct book ever. I I, I just slaughtered the article of faith, um, but but basically Mormons believe that the reason why we had the Book of Mormon is because it's pure God to Native American prophets to Joseph Smith with a pure translation process, um, most correct book ever. And so that's the whole value proposition of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And then if you think about it. As well, this is like God and Jesus's chance to deliver the pure, unadulterated gospel, not just to, you know, Nephites and Lamanites and their descendants, but to us, right? right? And so you think, if ever it's going to be pure, if ever it's going to be perfect, this is it. Yep. And so, like you said, why is this in King James English to begin with? And then 
why is the King James Bible in here and the exact edition that Joseph had? And then why are the italics are influencing it? And then yeah. why are there inaccuracies and problems? And the reason why that's all significant is because that's that's the whole value proposition to begin with. You know, we we are we are downgrading the Bible because of its problems. And so it makes no and selling the Book of Mormon because of its purity. So it makes no sense that the Book of Mormon is importing the impurities of the Holy Bible into the Book of Mormon when with a with a magic stone and God's pure revel, revelatory power, this would have been the chance to get the pure words of Jesus, you know, straight from the God's mouth, so to speak. Yeah, and and it, and it would have been a win-win for Joseph Smith, because if you're translating off of old brass plates and you're getting the translation that's different than the KGV, which at the time would have been jarring to the people of Joseph's time, and then over the next couple of decades or century, all of a sudden people are like, holy crap, the Book of Mormon's translation of Isaiah is actually closer to what we have with these better translations, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, whatever the case might be. Then all of a sudden it's like Joseph Smith was a prophet because no one at the time would have known that. But instead he's just rehashing the KGV and it goes against not just the translations we have today, but it also goes against the accounts of the witnesses um, of the process. And so all of these little things combine together to tell you that something is off. And, and that is where, if you're going to make an apologetic response, you have to explain how you get back to a place that can be reconciled by the evidence that doesn't put this as a 19th century text. And so far, I've not seen anyone do that in a way that's that doesn't create like a privilege, like a special pleading for Joseph Smith. And without kind of using God to fill in those gaps, it just can't be done because the evidence is too overwhelming. Yeah. And again, if you want to learn more about Deutero Isaiah, we talked briefly about Deutero Isaiah in the Anachronisms episode, yep. but we're going to have Deutero Isaiah is going to get its own episode. Yeah, it's going to have its own episode because that's a really important one. And, um, and Huge. It's, yeah. It's, For many, it's, it's like up there with the Book of Abraham. Yep as like one of the smoking guns of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, it's a big one. And um, so now we're going to talk some about the New Testament material in the Book of Mormon. And I know we've talked about this before in a lot of episodes. So what we want to do here is just kind of, again, restate that any use of the New Testament is anachronistic because the Book of Mormon people would not have had access to this in any way. Uh, but it's not so much in this particular episode that the New Testament material is in there. It's that it's bringing in translation errors, um, compiled text and late editions in the process, kind of like the last era we just showed. Um, so we're going to give a, a little bit of a teaser to two upcoming episodes um, because they illustrate this problem really well. And okay. we're going to talk about them here. Yeah, just we'll do one slide on a couple of them. So first we're going to do um, this one is just kind of giving a, a bit of a intro to it. So here's a um, wait that no, we did. We did this one. So actually we're going to go um, the next slide. There we go. So the long ending of Mark is one that, we're going to have an episode on, but effectively the original ending of Mark would end at chapter 16, verse eight. And almost all scholars now concede that verses nine through 20 um, in Mark 16 were written up to 200 years after the initial manuscripts likely attached from a scribe who was trying to give an ending to the book, uh, to the gospel of Mark. That'd be more um, liked by the community because they did not like how abrupt it was. And so that is something, again, we're going to have a whole episode on this and go into that in more detail, but just understand that a lot of the newer translations even put notes in there saying um, verses 9 through 20 are not in the original and earliest manuscripts. And so what I want to read is Mark 15, uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, and then compare it to the Book of Mormon. And so it says, and he said unto them, go ye in, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth shall not be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now compare that to Mormon chapter nine, verses 20 through, through 24. For behold, thus said Jesus Christ, the son of God, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so this is just showing that Joseph Smith is pulling from the KGV and not understanding this is a late edition. And so he's pulling it directly into the Book of Mormon 
and again, it's an anachronism already, right? Because it's New Testament, but this is also showing that he doesn't understand um, that this is a late edition. And again, we're gonna have an episode on this, so we'll go into this in a lot more detail, but it's just to point out that we have the italics we mentioned earlier, we have the translation errors, and now we're having late editions that are being pulled into the Book of Mormon that should have no place there because they're not authentic to the original text. Yeah, and and without listening to um, you know, the long ending of Mark episode, I I I had never heard of that before, and so I struggled to understand it during that episode, which we've already recorded. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just to, it it really does end abruptly in the middle. It's like a reboot. I, t- I call yeah. it control I'll delete. You're reading, you're reading that last chapter of Mark, and then all of a sudden it 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 clearly ends, and then it like starts over and then says a bunch more stuff. It's yep. obvious that 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 uh, made no sense. And and so these verses that you're quoting here are are in the later part of that chapter yep. that were added later. And then and again, unless you go watch that full episode, you might struggle to follow. Yeah. But it is important to mention here in this episode. Yeah, when we get there, it'll make a lot more sense because we go into more detail. But it's just just to show in this particular point that there are late additions being brought in in addition to all the other errors we mentioned. And it's just really important because this is not an issue where the King James Bible presents like one problem. It's it's translation, it's italics, it's late editions. All of these things Joseph Smith is assuming are close to what the original intent was because he doesn't have a lot of the biblical scholarship we have in 2022, but that also um, leaves his fingerprints on the text. And it also makes claims um, that we can now test better. And they're just not coming up as passing those tests as far as the evidence proving them to be credible yeah. and ancient. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, it's just hard not to say that those those verses in Mark, well, that the, the, those verses in Mormon weren't weren't heavily inspired or influenced. Yeah, I mean they're those, you're, they're pulling in phrases just identical. So to say that you know that they don't belong, it, it's a problem. By the way, this is totally just out of place. But wouldn't it have been amazing if Jesus gives us new teachings and new principles in the Book of Mormon? that he didn't give us in the Bible. I know you've probably already said that a bunch of times, but like, it's just really sinking into my brain now. Wouldn't it have been cool if Jesus taught new doctrine to the Lamanites, Lamanites and Nephites that, that we didn't hear in the Bible? Wouldn't that have been yeah. super cool? I mean, that's just it. And that's uh, that's a good segue like, into our, our next said, one. By, but for behold, the three degrees yeah. of glory are real. Or for behold, someday... You, you know, Joseph Smith, you know, someday Mormons will be called to practice polygamy. Like, come on, Jesus, Book of Mormon, Jesus, you could have given us more. <laughs> well, I think that's just it. And like, you know, again, you know, if we go, we'll go to the next slide because the Sermon on the Mount to me is is the biggest uh, illustration of what you just said, which is we're going to have a separate episode on this as well. So this is kind of just a really short kind of tease for that. But when the writer of the Book of Mormon, or actually I'll back up a second. So the Sermon on the Mount is obviously a famous sermon in Matthew. And in the Book of Mormon, they have the Sermon at the Temple, which is effectively rehashing the Sermon on the Mount. And so the problem is it relies on the reader of the Book of Mormon accepting the fact that Jesus is going to give the exact same sermon in America that he would have given in you know in the old world. And the problem is that by doing so, it's going to have a lot of things that don't make sense to people in America, just as if you're a presidential can- candidate and you're giving a stump speech in Seattle, Washington, you're going to want to give a different one if you went to say like, you know, Georgia, because they, they have different different needs of these states. And in the Book of Mormon, you can see where Joseph Smith, just like we mentioned with the italics, he's very concerned with certain phrases that he knows won't make any sense to the people in America. But because he doesn't know that some of the other ones are what, what exactly they are, he leaves them in. But then when now through the hindsight of having more scholarship, we can show that those phrases would have no meaning either. And so then you'd have to believe that Jesus is going and telling people stuff that would just have absolutely no meaning to them and in fact be confusing because they'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? And and these are the ways you can tell that Joseph Smith is starting with the King James Bible and then just making some superficial changes to fit the Book of Mormon's um, narrative as it goes. And by doing so in the Sermon on the Mount, um, the best example of that is when you get to- um, This is good. This uh, is really good. Yeah. yeah. So in Matthew 5, 26, there's a phrase that says, Thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. And so Joseph Smith knows that farthing is English currency and would have absolutely no meaning in the Americas. So Joseph Smith in Nephi 12.26 is going to change that. 
until thou hast paid the most, the uttermost senine. And that is um, the Nephite coinage that is mentioned in Alma, which is just two books earlier and then never mentioned again after this one passing mention. It's almost like Joseph Smith knew he needed to set up currency for this exact moment. I mean, that's my kind of personal thought on that is he sets it up two books ahead so that he's ready for this because he knows that that means nothing. Um, but the problem gets deeper because the Sermon on the Mount that's is going to... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Using the word C9 again confirms the tight translation narrative that Joseph can come up with words that uh, yep. aren't understood um, in in modern parlance. And yep. of course, that makes all the apologetic attempts to to um, to do the loan shifting that we talked about in last episode to explain all the anachronistic words. It just I just have to reiterate that invalidates all of those attempts to to loan yeah. shift and to redefine words because we yep. know Joseph can call any person or any object whatever name it actually was because of the tight translation reading from the stone in the hat. Yep. Okay, yeah, because yeah, because he, he works in, in this entire monetary system, which is basically used once and then thrown away, which is another area that tells you when they talk about complexity and they'll say, oh, he's got a currency system. It's like he's got a currency system that's mentioned like twice and then gone. And that tells you he brought it up to to get through a specific problem, which I believe is it might be this case mm. to get through the Sermon on the Mount. And then it's gone. And then, so he mentions that. But then on the other hand, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus refers to the Roman law of going a mile in Matthew 5, 41. It says, and whoever uh, shall compel thee go to go a mile, go with him twain. And this ends up in, in 3 Nephi 12, 41. And the problem is this is a Roman law. So by the time Jesus is telling this to the people in the Americas, they would be like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what that means. Meaning Joseph, mile, uh, the word mile? Yeah, I think it's something like with... Um, I don't know if it's slavery or something, but if you um, you have mile, to wait, wait, because mile is a British unit of measurement of distance, right? And uh, Nephites wouldn't have Nephites wouldn't have used the word mile. So why why couldn't he said dollar for you know when he said C9 or yeah. or quarter? He's going to use the Nephite word for currency, but yeah. then he's going to use a British word for distance. That doesn't I don't make even sense. Know. In Britain, they use in Britain they use kilometers, right? So I, I don't even no, know actually. No, no, I don't no, even. No, 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 no. They, they use miles there. Mile is a is like is like. I mean, it would have to be right. It's in the KGB, so yeah. But yeah. So but the, so again, why would God use C nine in one verse, but mile in like a sub? Well, yeah, and that's and that's the problem because mile he knew would be familiar to everybody, and so he doesn't need to change it. But he knows that farthing would be a red flag to say, why in the world is Jesus talking about farthing? Whereas mile works in America, so there's no need to change it. But, but the bigger problem is just this is a Roman law that is about um, going a mile, I think, with a slave or something like that. And I, I should have, uh, we'll do more of this in the Sermon on the Mount episode because I have a lot more on that. But it, it would have no meaning to the Book of Mormon people. And that is really where it, it's a really easy way to know that Joseph Smith is seeing the superficial changes he needs, he needs to make, but he doesn't understand some of the other things. And so he leaves them in, but those are just as problematic. And it tells you, where that he's starting from the King James Bible before he makes these changes. There's no way to work from the brass or the gold plates as a translation and make these changes um, because they would already be changed because they would never be mentioned in the first place. And it just shows just like with the italics, he's focused on these things that stand out and are out of place. But then when he doesn't kind of understand what it is like with the, the go, go a mile um, part for the Roman law, he, he leaves it because he just doesn't know it's a problem. Yeah. And again, why are these, you know, Britishisms, why are these Romanisms, why are these problems with the Bible all being imported into the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to be the most correct book ever? Yep. And, that, and that's just it. I mean, we're just having, and these things just pile on. And so, you know, it continues on. And so, um, you know, there are other examples of where the writer of the Book of Mormon brings in words from the KGB that hold different meanings as to how they were actually used. And so a really cool example is in Second Nephi. In Isaiah 5, 4, it says, Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. In 2 Nephi 15, 4, it says, Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And from the write-up I mentioned earlier about some of these King James um, issues, what they say is the distinction is subtle but important. In the KGV, wherefore means why. So if you read it, read it, read it that way, in the KGV, it should say why, 
when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. It doesn't mean wherefore like as a transition, but the NRSV, um, which is a better translation, actually changes it to when I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? But the Book of Mormon changes it into a conjunction as like wherefore, you know, meaning like therefore this happened. And so he says, wherefore, when I looked that it should bring grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And this is a small thing. Again, these are some of these problems are small problems, but they tell you that he's working off of the King James text because of the fact that he's kind of misusing wherefore there and kind of interjecting the 19th century use of wherefore into the KGV translation, except he got it incorrect. And that kind of tells us that he misunderstood what the text was trying to say, which tells us that he started with the KGV and not from, you know, a translation off of gold plates. Yeah, because the the translators of the King James Bible weren't, they weren't, you know, they weren't God, right? right. They were just men doing their yep. best to translate their understanding of Hebrew or of Greek, yep. you know, or, or whatever. This was God's chance to give us the, you know, we know, you know, from saying Pele El in the temple ceremony, we know that Joseph Smith could find out God's pure language, the Adamic language, that Joseph could receive that right. sort of revelation. Why couldn't Joseph have translated God's pure, you know, translation of the original intent of the Bible? Yeah, and that's just, I mean, like, you, we have so many instances where Joseph Smith has a chance to get it right and to show that what was around him was wrong. And every time he tends to just go with what was already out there, and that tells you that he doesn't or make it worse or make it worse. And that yeah. tells you that he's working from a 19th century, um, in this case, source text. And, and there's no way around it because all of these problems pile up. You can't just pull one at a time. And, and when you have all of them coming together at once, it tells you there's no way around the fact that he used the KGB when, when dictating the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to get to apologetic responses to the King James Version problem for the Book of Mormon. What do the apologists have to say about all this? Yeah, so this is from the Fair Mormon response to the CES letter um, about their section on the KGB. And it says, the Book of Mormon incorporates text which seems to be taken from the Bible, including passages which are now considered to be mistranslations in the King James Version. We do not know the specific mechanism by which the biblical passages were included in the translation. Therefore, we cannot answer this question definitively based upon current historical information. The only description of the translation process that Joseph Smith ever gave was that it was performed by the gift and power of God and that the translation was performed using the Urim and Thummim. And the one really nice thing about this particular quote is that Fair is acknowledging that the Book of Mormon contains errors that are unique to the King James Version of the Bible. So that's why this verse, why this quote is helpful, just because right off the bat, they are acknowledging that this is a problem and that they don't have an answer for it. Yeah, and this is a non-answer answer. It is, yeah. Um, both because it's basically just saying we don't know anything, so we can't we can't make observations or criticisms about the resulting text um, because Joseph Smith didn't give us more detail, except for the fact that the witnesses to the Book of Mormon made it very clear how the the dictation, the translation, the dictation was happening. Right, and so we really do know. Yeah, that's just it. And so we really do know. And the apologists know that we know, but they're trying to, they want to make it vague when it suits them to make it vague. And then they want to make it specific when it suits them to make it specific. Yeah, exactly. And so that kind of is a good transition to our next one. And so this is more from the Fair Mormon response um, on the CS letter. And they say, witnesses to the translation process never reported that a Bible or any other book was present during the translation. Given this evidence, we could assume that the biblical passages were revealed to Joseph during the translation process in a format format almost identical with similar passages in the King James Bible. Joseph performed most of the translation in the open using the stone and the hat. Thus, how do we get the language from the King James Version of the Bible? And on this one, I just point out the word assume is doing a lot because they're, they're trying to make an assumption that kind of gives them plausibility here. Um, and we know what the witnesses say happened. We know that the witnesses say it was read, and if it wasn't read correctly, it wouldn't go to the next thing. So that's what we do know. Um, and we know that they would have gotten that information from Joseph because obviously they're not putting their head in the hat. They can't see it. So they only know what Joseph tells them in this case. And what I would point out is that we've said this in a lot of our overviews, but once you start making these kind of assumptions that do not fit with the evidence we do have, it just becomes indistinguishable from outright fraud. And so to say we don't have evidence that Joseph Smith had the Bible open 
that doesn't mean it didn't happen. The fact that we have so much coming straight from the Bible is evidence that he's using it. So for them to say, well, we don't know how he did it doesn't change yeah. the fact that we know he did do it. Yeah, and it could be anything from they were co-conspirators in, in knowingly creating a fraudulent book to during the during the times when Joseph Smith was clearly quoting from the version of the King James Bible we know he had, that he had a sheet up, that he was sitting in the stairwell, um, to he wrote stuff that he put in his hat. Like, um, you know, there, there are lots of very plausible explanations for, for you know, uh, how he may have used the King James Bible and maybe even hidden it from the scribes. But like you say, what we know for sure is that he used it because there's a gazillion fingerprints that he did. So yeah. the proof would be on the apologists to prove that he didn't use it yeah. when, when all the evidence points to the contrary. Yeah. And, and, you know, the one thing, too, is like I really don't believe any of them are co-conspirators just because they do seem to be true believers. There's no indication of any kind that they are in on it. But I would argue that, you know, when they talk about Joseph never having a book open, that to me more refers to like the Spalding manuscript theory. But Joseph Smith having a Bible open, I don't think would raise any alarm bells for That's any of the, the witnesses. It's, it's you know, so Joseph Smith could, and, and one of the things we hear sometimes with um, his treasure digging is sometimes he would say he would, needed to take a break because his eyes hurt. And you could just as easily see Joseph Smith saying, I recognize that they're referring to this chapter of Isaiah. My eyes hurt. I'm going to read off of here and I'm going to pray about it and see if God is okay with it. I mean, you, there are a lot more plausible scenarios where Joseph Smith has the Bible open and no one really thinks anything bad of that because it's not a, a, like a completely foreign manuscript like view of the Hebrews. Um, and I think that is almost certainly what likely happened with those Isaiah chapters where Joseph could say, my eyes hurt from looking at the rock, but I'm recognizing that it's these chapters of Isaiah and I'm going to read them from the KGV because it's the same thing effectively. And nobody would probably think anything of it from a witness standpoint. And at that point, remember, only Oliver is involved in the process anyway. So you really only need one person. He doesn't really talk a whole lot about the translation like ever. So, you know, I, I just think, I think Fair, like you said, is trying to kind of create this, this alternate universe. That's a good kind of point. That's universe. a good point, right? But, but yeah. When we talk about Joseph Smith using the stone in the hat and having nothing else there, that's usually Emma or Martin Harris, yeah, or David or Whitmer, the Whitmer brothers, yeah, or Isaac Hale. We can't forget Isaac Hale. Yeah. So but yeah, it's not so Oliver. Oliver so, was probably relatively silent and commanded to be silent. There's all sorts of stuff Oliver didn't tell us that we have no idea because he yeah. didn't really talk about it at all. That's he a didn't really talk good about point. it at all. And so it's it's That's it's hard. Really because, yeah, I just I don't think that you can draw any conclusions there. Like I said, because you can show he did use it then it yeah. really becomes irrelevant. Like if it was open on a table or if he said, my eyes hurt and you take a break because we know he did it. So that part yeah. is interesting, but it's not important. Yeah. And it reminds me of that saying that the um, absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Yep. And in fact, what the evidence shows is the presence of a King yeah. James version of the Bible. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, and so the apologetic attempt to say, we don't have any evidence of somebody saying you use the Bible. That's no evidence. That's, yeah, that's it doesn't help. Literally nothing. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, it's actually that argument is made in the face of factual evidence that, that is hard to dispute. Yeah. Yeah. And, so we mentioned in our last episode, the Royal Skousen kind of approach. And so I want to kind of reference that here because it's important for this one as well. And this is part of Fair Mormon's response. And they talk about um, when considering the, the, the data, Royal Skousen proposes that instead of Joseph or Oliver looking at a Bible, that God was simply able to provide the pa page of text from the King James Bible to Joseph's mind. And then Joseph was free to alter the text as he pleased. In those cases where the Book of Mormon simply alludes to or echoes KGB language, Perhaps the Lord would allow, allow those portions of the text to be revealed in such a way that they would be more comprehensible, comfortable to his 19th century Northeastern frontier audience. And Okay, so let me, for people that just heard a bunch of words but didn't really grasp what that just said. So Skousen, which is a paid BYU professor, right, who's literally paid to try and keep people from losing their faith, right? His yep. theory is, is that Joseph Smith is looking at the stone in the hat that Joseph presents to him in his mind's eye a picture of the Bible page that he would be familiar with, and then Joseph's doing doing remix on the fly. But God just showed him the erroneous 
um, you know, version of the Bible because that's what Joseph would have felt most comfortable massaging. Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. And, and it's a problem because just like we mentioned the last slide, Fair Mormon talks about the witnesses to the process. Well, the witnesses in the process tell you without any question, Joseph was not free to alter anything. And so, right, because it's the the word appears on the stone. Yep. Joseph reads the stone to the scribe. Yep. The scribe writes it down, says, I wrote it down. The stone hears that. And then the stone then erases the previous words and shows new ones. Yep. None of that, that tight versus loose translation theory just shoots down Skousen's theory yeah, here. It does. So why would he make such a disingenuous claim? Because most people tend to respect Skousen's work uh, as it relates to the to the manuscripts of the early Book of Mormon, you know, um, printing process, right? Yeah. And I don't know particularly why he made, like, I don't know what context he made this theory and how Fair Mormon is using it, if they're using it quite right or not. But this is how they replied with their CS to reply to say why we would have it. And, uh, you know, just to point out that it goes against the witness accounts that they previously cite. And um, it's only created out of necessity because they would not be making this claim if the translation didn't have issues. You're only making this claim to try to basically kind of retreat to a position that is plausible after your initial claims are proven false. And, I, you know, I think that's really all that needs to be said there is just that these are just, these are apologetics that just, they come out of necessity. They come out of, out of trying to find a solution to a problem they don't have a solution for. And by the way, Russell M. Nelson has a seer stone and he is, you know, ordained as a prophet, seer and revelator. He could freaking look into his seer stone or he could just pray to Heavenly Father and Heavenly yep. Father could tell him how the Book of Mormon was translated. He could tell him how, how and why the King James Version appears in the Bible. Like, why do we have modern day prophet, seers and revelators if all they're going to do is say, hey, you know, eat healthy and be a good dad and be a good spouse and and pay your tithing and, and read your scriptures? Yeah. Like, why don't they use their their gifts as prophets, seers, and revelators to answer some of these questions instead of relying on unofficial apologists who are not um, ordained and, yeah. and they have no office. Yeah, I mean, why should like, we listen to Skousen? Well, I mean, yeah, and I'm sure they would say, why should they listen to me? But yeah, it's just it's it, it goes to the point of you either have answers or you don't, and, and or you know you've got like the apologetic answers. But if you're going to do that, then you have to answer the other the other side of it and. Um, the, you know, yeah. like I said, so we, we just kind of already touched on this, but the tight versus loose translation episode we did is so important because it fits into all of these episodes so well. And, you know, David Whitmer said when it was written down and repeated to brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear. And another character with the interpretation would appear. Martin Harris said, if correctly written, the sentence would disappear in another in its place. But if not written correctly, it remained until corrected so that the translation was just as it was engraven on the plates precisely in the language then used. It is impossible to reconcile those two statements of the people who were there at the time um, with the fair Mormon approach and the Royal Scouts and apologetic that Joseph Smith was allowed to change the text on, on the stone as he saw fit. It, you just, you cannot reconcile those two things. And so for me, I believe any historian would tell you, you go with the earlier one because the people that were there contemporaneously are going to be more correct than the people 200 years later who are trying to account for the errors that, that came from that initial you know dictation. Yeah. And if God can make like in the Jared Art bar, if he can make like stones light up, if he can make a, you know, a vessel tied into a dish that can be submerged with animals yeah. and not leak and not blow up, he can freaking give Joseph an accurate translation of the Bible when, when Joseph's like reading from a magic stone. Like well, yeah. God can do this. He, he's powerful enough to do it. Well, I mean, we and we we have to believe that that God gave him an accurate description of of the rest of the Book of Mormon, the stuff that isn't in the Bible. I mean, so it's really hard, and that's why the tight versus loose is so important because it it really implies that you have this tight translation for the stuff that's not in the Bible, the loose translation for the stuff that isn't. The idea that you could jump between the two constantly it just doesn't work with what we know from the witnesses, and so that's why that conversation was so important to have because now that we're doing these later episodes, you can see for yourself like why those two translation methods can't be reconciled as a jump back and forth because it goes against everything we do have and only comes as a way to try to salvage um, the text as being historical when the evidence is telling us overwhelmingly that it, it can't be. Got it. All right. So what does BYU professor Richard Lloyd Anderson have to say about all this? Yeah. And so this was a, uh, an article in uh, the 1977 enzyme, which uh, Richard Lloyd Anderson writes, and he's going to um, quote um, a Latter-day scholar named Daniel H. Ludlow, um, 
who is emphasizing the inherent variety of independent translations, um, and he concludes, there appears to be only one answer to explain the word-for-word -word similarities between the verses of Isaiah in the Bible and the same verses in the Book of Mormon. That is simply that Joseph must have opened Isaiah and tested each, mes each mentioned verse by the Spirit. If his translation was essentially the same as that of the King James Bible uh, version, he apparently quoted the verse from the Bible. Thus, the Old Testament passages from Isaiah display a particular choice of phraseology that suggests Joseph Smith's general freedom throughout the Book of Mormon for optional wording. Now, what in the heck was that gobbledygook saying? Yeah, so basically he's saying that Joseph would open the Bible, and instead of reading like off of the rock in a hat, he's going to read each verse to Oliver, and effectively God is going to answer him um, on each verse to tell him, yes, that's okay, or no, that's not okay. So this would be more of like um, how he translated the Joseph Smith translation into the Bible. So you're reading it and getting impressions as to whether or not it is allowed to go straight through. Um, but like I said earlier, this is a problem because of the fact that you're still bringing in errors. So then you get into that whole area of like, does that mean God was okay with some errors, but not others? Um, does it mean God was okay with Joseph basically kind of for convenience going to the Bible as opposed to reading off of the stone? It just opens a lot of other problems. And this answer is only being given to try to solve other problems. But when you try to solve this one, then it opens up others. And that's kind of what I've been mentioning in some of these overviews is just to say, it's this is sweet, basically loose translation, right? It's loose translation. And it just, it doesn't, then you then have to address all the problems that come from a loose translation. And they're not going to do that because they don't, the, the implications here go well beyond what he's saying, but he's hoping you just read this and just kind of go, yep, that makes sense. But it, it, it goes so much deeper. And that's why we've been spending so much time on these problems to try to illustrate that. Got it. Yeah. You can't have it both ways. You can't have yeah. it that God wanted a tight translation in these parts. And then, yeah, just go get the Book of Mormon and read whatever, or go get your King James Bible, read whatever. And even if it's got errors in it, I don't care. You know, yeah, it's it just, anyway. yeah, it just, it doesn't match with everything else we have within Mormonism as a whole and with revelation as a whole, it just doesn't work. And, and it defeats the purpose of having the most correct book. Again, right. to be importing all the errors. Into exactly. I mean, okay. just why would you do that? And so, you know, just kind of rehash what we just said. Um, you know, the apologetic spin here is that God is allowing Joseph Smith to copy directly from the KGB instead of simply dictating what appeared on the stone. And it's just an argument that goes against common sense when you look at the witness accounts that are telling us that Joseph had to read directly off the stone. Um, and I just I can't understand how you could say that in some parts he's got his head in his hat that cannot change unless you read it perfectly. And then he's allowed to sit it down, go grab a Bible, read a few verses, and then go back to the stone. And the stone's just going to pick up, you know, the stone's like catching up. It, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. And, and so that is why I say, if you start with a clean slate and you start with the witness accounts and you use that as your kind of guide to look at the text, this stuff is really clear that Joseph Smith is pulling this and he's pulling it improperly in cases. And it just, it opens up so many problems that all of them point to the author of the Book of Mormon being Joseph Smith, and that's why we have those errors. If it was an ancient text on gold plates, um, that a tight translation, as we're told, you just wouldn't have the, the 1611 yeah. or 1769 errors in there. It just it wouldn't happen. Yeah. And so Fair tells us, uh, don't worry, the evidence yeah. is just around the corner. Yeah, and you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in the anachronism episode where they always kind of tell you, look, we're we're getting there and it's it's gonna keep going. And so um, this is one um, from their response to the CS letter about King James Bible errors being in, in the Book of Mormon. And so what they say is, um, it is not the case that the great Isaiah scroll is the original text of Isaiah. It is an earlier witness to the text than we previously had before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's, it itself is centuries removed from the originals. And this is an argument that is true because even the gospel manuscripts, the earliest gospel manuscripts of the New Testament, I think are uh, 100, 200 years old. So ideally, or not ideally, but they would have been written down over and over again. So we've lost a lot in the gospels that we have from what they probably originally were written as. But this doesn't help um, the problem that we're talking about with the Book of Mormon, because even though the original Isaiah text would be different than what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the fact is the King James Bible is pulling from a very specific translation. So whatever changes might have happened earlier has no impact on what ends up in the Book of Mormon. If the Book of Mormon had Isaiah different from the King James Bible and it didn't match the Dead Sea Scrolls, you could make that argument because you could say, look, we don't know what to compare to. But in this case, we know exactly where it comes from. So to say there might be an earlier text that's different, it just doesn't help Joseph Smith in any way because we can pinpoint exactly what he's pulling from. Okay, so just to try and make sense of this, I guess the great Isaiah scroll 
is is some a compendium of uh the writings of Isaiah and yeah. um it would be the one that that contains Deutero Isaiah uh well I think um I think it would because it, the I'm not, not positive on this but the great Isaiah scroll I think would be the one that was discovered with all these scrolls so it's just as the the earliest scroll that we have and they're saying the earliest scroll we have is not going to be the very first Isaiah scroll ever written so they're saying that we would have lost a lot of um or had changes throughout every one from scribes. And so they're saying because of that, we can't judge what's in the Book of Mormon because we we're, we know eventually we'll find earlier manuscripts this that'll almost, tell us. This almost feels like the missing scroll theory in the Book of Abraham. It is a little bit, yeah. They're trying to just shift your concern away from the Deutero-Isaiah problem to say, well, there's earlier versions, more complete versions, more accurate yeah. versions. And so you can't trust the evidence that's right staring you in front of your face yeah and 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 just to reiterate the fact that even if you had an earlier isaiah scroll and maybe you even someday find a scroll that you can tell was the very first one ever written and it's a lot different the wording is different some of the phrases are different it's not going to help joseph smith because the book of mormon tethers itself to the king james bible version so no matter what you see before it whatever changes might come they're not going to change the fact that the book of mormon is relying on the king james bible it doesn't really matter at that point because of the fact that Joseph Smith is pulling in errors from that exact version. So I'm, I'm honestly not sure what their point is outside of telling members, hey, if you just keep, keep eventually we'll find out these answers, but don't worry about it. Because otherwise, an earlier scroll is just, it's just not going to help because the earlier scroll, however different it's going to be, is still going to be um, irrelevant to the Book of Mormon tying itself to the King James Bible. Got it. Okay. Um so the next slide is deflecting by saying the manuscripts are copies of copies. This is similar. Yeah, it's, it's similar to what we just said. And so Ferris says, even the Book of Mormon text would have been far removed from Isaiah. The brass plates would have been at least a century after the fact with many copies intervening. And that was copied and recopied into the Book of Mormon records, which was translated not in a scholarly fashion, but instead by the gift and power of God through Joseph Smith. Therefore, it is a fallacy to assume that the Book of Mormon text ought to be the exact equivalent to the original text. And so to reiterate what I said in the last slide, because this is important, what they're saying is that it's our fault for expecting it to look like, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but that's not at all what we're arguing. What we're saying is it matches a translation done in 1611. No one's saying the Book of Mormon should match the original text because no one can say what the original text looked like. But what we're saying is that the Book of Mormon claims to have been written thousands of years earlier it shouldn't match a translation written in 1611 that just happened to be owned by Joseph Smith. That's that's the problem. It has nothing to do with what the original text might have looked like. It has to do with Joseph Smith was copying from a 1611 translation. So if Joseph Smith had said, um, my heart delighteth in Isaiah in the Book of Mormon and, and then copied chapters and with all sorts of changes that we don't know what they are, we'd be like, well, we don't know. It's because we do know where he pulled them from that we can judge them. Not so they're kind of trying to flip it on its head. But I again, I don't know why because it it's kind of irrelevant um, to me to claim that earlier copies of of the Bible would somehow make Joseph relying on a sixteen eleven translation any better. It, it wouldn't solve the problem. It would just create a better earlier translation for scholars to look at. But Joseph Smith in the in the Mormon Church is still tied to nineteenth century translations and ideas. It doesn't really matter. And this is where apologists want us to focus on the bark of the tree and never really look at the forest. And so they make disingenuous arguments that may address a micro issue or at least create plausible deniability or reasonable doubt for an attack against a church claim in the specific when they know that that argument to deal with the specific criticism undermines their broader um, rationalization for, yeah. for the truthfulness of what they teach. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, like I said, at some point it doesn't matter if, if they find an earlier one, it won't matter for Mormonism. And that's why I'm like, why are yeah. we talking about this? It won't, it won't herring. help you. It's a red herring, right? It is. It's just, it's so irrelevant. And yet it sounds good when you read it. And that's, what's kind of frustrating about it. But yeah. But yeah and um, so I'll, instead of doing a conclusion slide, I'm going to let Richard Bushman do the conclusion for us <laughs> because this quote is a really honest and important quote. And it's from an interview he did on Mormon discussions with Bill Real. Really and, quickly for, for those, just to be clear, Richard oh yeah, Bushman, ahead. what's that? No, no, go ahead. Richard Bushman is a former Mormon uh, stake president, which is a, a higher than a bishop. Yep. He's a former Mormon church patriarch. He's Harvard trained 
scholar who is a professor of of history at Columbia University. He is the church's foremost Joseph Smith scholar. He wrote Rough Stone Rolling that Deseret uh, that the church commissioned him to write, and that Deseret book published. He is the church, and he's still a faithful believer. So in every way, he's yeah. completely legitimate and the best faithful Joseph Smith scholar the church has. <laughs> yeah. And so he had done an interview with Bill Reel on Mormon discussions a while back, and this is his quote. And he says, and then there is the fact that there is phrasing everywhere, long phrases that if you Google them, you will find in 19th century writings. The theology of the Book of Mormon is very much 19th century theology, and it reads like a 19th century understanding of the Hebrew Bible as an Old Testament. That is, it has Christ in it the way Protestants saw Christ everywhere in the Old Testament. That's why we now call it Hebrew Bible, because the Jews never quite never saw it quite that way. So these are all problems we have to deal with. And I just think this is a great way to conclude it, because he's right. Should, everywhere he, should have been in the anachronisms episode. Yeah, I know. I probably should have. I, I, I figured I had to include one or the other. And it's I just fine. think it's, good. it's, good. It, it's a good way as we start recapping this stuff to look at it, because it just shows that everything in the Book of Mormon is 19th century, and you can date it there. And you can show the source materials there. And so at some point, it's really hard to keep this equation that Joseph Smith couldn't have written it because of the fact that everything in the Book of Mormon that we can kind of pinpoint and date is pointing right back to him. And the fact that Richard Bushman is willing to kind of say it, even though he ultimately is going to maintain kind of a more faith promoting position, I think just shows that the church can no longer escape these things um, in the King James Bible use. It just encompasses all of the things that Richard Bushman just said. And so that's why it was important enough for us to do this episode to show why scholars can sh can really outline without any question that Joseph Smith used the King James Bible as a foundational text and what that says about the um, kind of credibility of the Book of Mormon as an ancient historical text. I love it. Okay. Well, as again, Mike from LDSDiscussions.com, a brilliant episode and dang, we're only like nine episodes in. I know. We, we've still, next episode's going to be how the Book of Mormon was composed. Then we're going to get into Adam and Eve, Global Flood, Tower of Babel, Sermon on the Mount in yep. detail, Long Ending of Mark, Deuter Isaiah in detail. And that's before we even get to First Vision, Priesthood Restoration, yeah. Word of Wisdom, Kinderhook Plates, and polygamy and book of abraham and so much more yeah but man what a what a powerful like if, if you're gonna have like nine or ten episodes to kind of set the stage and to provide the framing we've we've done some i think you've done some really important work here yeah like i said i think I, one of the cool things i think about this is you know these this episode and the anachronisms ones i think are really where you start to see everything we've done so far kind of tie together in a way that really shows why we did it the way we did it and i think Going back to that puzzle metaphor, now you're starting to see how the puzzle pieces are fitting together. And then once we get out of the Book of Mormon and the Bible stuff, when you start looking at the church history stuff, it's going to continue off of that. And I think that's why it's so important to do it this way. And I just hope, as I've said before, that people who watch it, even if you ultimately don't agree, that you can at least understand that this evidence is real, these problems are real. And hopefully, even if you don't ultimately agree with me, it'll help you a little more um, when you do interact with family members who might have doubts or, you know, with your people in your community who have left, because, you know, these are, are real problems that scholars can point to and say without any doubt that it shows the truth claims don't hold up. And, um, and I think just through our first, you know, nine episodes or whatever, we've illustrated how they, they pile onto each other and not in isolation. I think that's the really important thing is just showing the common threads and, um, and why they fit together naturally with the evidence in, in, in a way that is, like I said earlier, it's satisfying because it's really cool when you can kind of solve these little mysteries. And then all of a sudden when they start kind of naturally fitting together, it's, it's a really cool thing, even if it forces you to change your, your overall paradigm. And, and honestly, it was the Mormon church that taught me the truth matters. It was the Mormon church that taught me that honesty matters. And I want to live in reality. And uh, I want to base my decisions, how I live, how I raise my kids, how I, you know, whatever time I have on this earth, I want to spend it rooted in reality, you know, and if, if, you know, if there wasn't an Ephi, if there wasn't a layman, if, if Jesus didn't come to the Americas, if Native Americans are Native Americans and they're not Nephites and Lamanites, yeah. I want to know that. Yeah. I don't want to go to a Guatemalan and, and Mormon and say, hey, Lamanita, 
that's insulting. You know, we want to live in reality. <laughs> we do. And, and, you know, the thing is, um, it's really, and it, this happened for me and it still happens to a certain degree as, as I go through this stuff, but it's really scary to question your beliefs. And it's really scary to get to a point where you're like, if this isn't true, do I want to know? Um, and to your point, you do get to a point where you need to know. And you, because if you don't know, then, or if you know there's problems, but you won't look into them, then you're going to live the rest of your life kind of in the back of your head going, am I doing this for for the right reasons? Am I doing it because it's true or because I, I need it to be or because I want it to be? And and so doing these episodes, I think will hopefully help some people who maybe are early in that process and just trying to figure it out and, and maybe help them to kind of more of a gentle landing, a, a better understanding so that it's not quite as emotional um, as some of the things you'll come across online are, that'll be a little more gentle, a little bit more... Um, you know, consumable so that it helps you to get to that point of, of understanding or at least getting some answers to some questions you might have in a way that you, maybe you could share with others and it won't be so um, like feeling like you're being ambushed or feeling like you're being attacked. And, um, and I just hope as we keep going that that'll be kind of the spirit of it where it's, it's, it's about, you know, if you want to know this stuff here, we're here for you. And if you don't, we'll be here when you are, you know, if you want to watch this in a year, cause you're not ready for it, that's okay. Just know that this material is here when you're ready for it. All right, Mike, you're a treasure, and we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to take us through this series. And we've got 20 or 30. Yeah, we got a lot more to go. <laughs> 20 or 30 more episodes to go, which is going to yep. be amazing. It will. Thanks, everybody, for All checking right, it Mike. out and talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. And again, everybody, um, the essay that we were referring to today is at ldsdiscussions.com slash KJV. We have other show notes in the show notes within a week of this being released. Hopefully you'll be able to find links to the other episodes like the tight versus loose translation episode, the book of Mormon anachronisms episode and the long ending of Mark episode. Um, and eventually the Deutero Isaiah episode. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have links to all of those. We'll also have time codes so that you can jump back and forth um, to different parts of the um of this presentation as you so desire. You can also always slow it down if we're going too fast at, at 0.7 speed or speed it up to two times speed if we're going too slow. Um, we just want to make these episodes usable for everybody. Uh, we love your feedback. Please give us feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. We also love your comments on YouTube um, in the chat or in the comments section or on Facebook, or you can uh, leave comments on the blog. We're grateful for that. Please share this information. If you disagree, if you think we've got it wrong, if you think we've interpreted the history wrong, if you think our context is wrong, we invite you to let us know either through email or through the comments, wherever you want to make comments. We want your feedback. If if you can demonstrate that Mike and I got something wrong, we'll freaking bring you on Mormon Stories podcast and let you make your case if you have a credible case. And then finally, we just want to remind you all that if you really value this stuff, if you like it, so many people have told us they love these episodes, but we need you to know that we're losing donors every month. We're gaining donors and losing donors every month, but we need to replace the donors that we lose. And, and when we lose donors, it's not because we've done anything wrong. Oftentimes, it's literally just because somebody um, loses their job or falls on financial hard times or... They lose interest or they've been studying this for 20 years and they're ready to move on. You know, sometimes their spouse finds out that they are supporting us and they get in trouble and they have to cancel their donation. So for whatever the reason is, we need you to step up and replace the donations or to just most importantly, tap in your, your, your uh, conscience, tap in your soul. If you have a, uh, a way to support us. And if you value this work, we would love you to demonstrate that and to support the work, not only for current generations, but for future generations. So to support us financially, click on uh, click on the links in the description, go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, set it and forget it, whatever amount works for you, 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. These episodes are tax deductible in the United States. Um, we're transparent in our finances. We publish our 990s every year when the IRS uh, completes them and, and lets us know they're available. And every dollar you spend is going to go to me, Gerardo, Jen, Jennifer, Brooklyn, the equipment, the lighting, the broadband, the studio, marketing, uh, 
there are all sorts of expenses, equipment, lighting, cameras, uh, lenses. So much goes into making all of this possible. Uh, we really want your support. And honestly, there's more we could do if we had more support. So please support us if you can. Thanks so much for all those who do support us. Thanks for your support of this uh, series. Uh, we really love and appreciate you guys. Most importantly, be kind to each other. Love each other. Um, don't tear people down. Find ways to build people up. But truth matters. Um, and uh, keep pursuing truth, everybody. Love you. Thank you. Uh, and we'll see you guys all again very soon on another episode.